Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final session of today. Um, I hope everyone has enjoyed uh, all the various um, conversations that's taking place and the, the panels earlier in the day. Uh, I definitely have. Um, today, um, this is the final session of the day, and we'll be talking about leaps and bounds for trade finance, digitization, and wondering how well, West Africa has kept pace. Um, we've got quite an interesting panel with us today. Um, and I hope everyone um, really sort of takes some one or two, you know, key takeaways from, from this conversation. Um, just whilst we wait for the room to fill up, um, we'll just try to get a feel for the, you know, what everyone's experience has been over the last, over the last year. Um, needless to say, you know, the, the, it's been business as unusual for everyone with the COVID crisis, and particularly, you know, um, West Africa in terms of how everyone is adapted. So we're just wondering, you know, how people have adapted to digitization, your trade fin your business in trade finance, and how you've adapted to digitization. So we just pull up uh, the poll questions, and I'll do a quick introduction to our panelists um, for today. Um, today with us, we've got James Kasui, um, Head of Financial Institutions um, at International um, Bank One. Um, Margaret, who is an advisor to a number of fintech companies, um, including trade assets. Um, Sophie, who is Senior Relationship Manager at, um, for North and West Africa, actually, for African Invest Private Credit. Um, Philip Boyle, who is um, Corporate Banking and Payment Sales for Sub-Saharan Africa at FinSnatra, um, a technology um, business um, providing solutions to banks. And last but not the least, joining us from Calgary, um, Nana Ado, um, Chief Executive of Imperial Energy, who does quite a lot of business in West Africa, Ghana in, in particular. Um, right, I think we'll just, you know, wrap up the poll um, questions and uh, we'll get, 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 go straight into it. So as mentioned already, um, you know, we are thinking about our businesses in trade finance adjusted or reacted to the current crisis and the role digitization has played in this. Um, has digitization been a, a, a nice to have or is it a key part of a business's strategy going forward? Um, of course, you know, lots has been said in various conferences and you know, in the lead up to the current environment we're in in terms of how digitization can and should transform the way um, trade finance is conducted globally, but of course, more importantly, in Africa and West Africa in this particular case. Um, just to get the poll and feel for, um, um, apart from our panelists, I just wondered if we just go around the house very quickly and you, everyone just tell us about what your experience has been over the last 12 months and how your businesses have adapted or not to digitization in trade finance. Uh, maybe we'll start with um, Sofin. Yes, thank you, Landry. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, the, the, the start of the crisis and the, the extent of it surprised us uh, a lot in the beginning. And, um, and we had quickly to, to adapt ourselves to, to, to this new context and to this new normal, which uh, it's called like that today. So um, the, the, our primary focus was to, 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 of course, support our existing clients, uh, our portfolio companies, uh, assessing the impact of the crisis, uh, handling the restructurings, uh, provide them additional support if needed. Um, so while part of the team was playing uh, this role of firemen with our, uh, with our portfolio companies, the other part of the team was thinking about uh, the future and how we can continue to do business in, um, in this new uh, normal. Um, so I, I would like to focus on this second um, uh, phase. Um, so the first step was uh, to identify the, the resilient countries, uh, the resilient sectors and the resilient companies that could continue to, um, to do business. Uh, and this was essentially possible thanks to the usage, usage of uh, several information platforms. Um, I mean, while we are in a world of over-information, it becomes very difficult to get uh, in the web uh, to find the, the, and get the right information that, that are useful. So the usage of some platforms allowed us to, um, to access uh, to filtered informations that were more or less oriented according to, to, to our needs. So uh, this, I would say, is the, 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 the first way, in a sense, uh, the, 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 how the digital digitalization helped us in this phase. And um, the second challenge was to do a transaction completely remotely. 
here also it was not easy as as the trust i mean is key in our offshore lending business uh, we don't know the person so uh, i mean to establish this trust is key and for us uh, i mean meeting in person the 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 um, the sponsor or visiting the company is really uh, key in that. So, uh, in addition of, um, I mean, of uh, of doing uh, the whole due diligence uh, remotely using, I mean, the, the 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 technological means that we are used to do. I mean, Teams and Skype and so on. Uh, we had to find a solution to able to be able to assess remotely the quality of the sponsor. Uh, in addition to to, um, to the classic testing uh, in some KYC platforms that we are used to um, to use, um, I mean the, the the assessment and the the, the reaction of the person uh, and the body language of a sponsor is key for us to establish. I mean this trust that that I was talking about. Um, so. Um, so in addition to, to video conferences that we, we, we used, uh, we had to adapt and engage third parties uh, checkings to, to, uh, to confirm our assessment. Uh, and I think this might for us as the offshore lender might be difficult to completely uh, digitize. Interesting. Thanks. Thanks for that, Sofin. Um, I think it just feels quite um, nicely to go to Phil, because obviously your uh, technology business and um, providing solutions across to the bank. So did you see quite an uptake in demand for your solutions across um, the continent or what, what has been the reaction um, to the current um, environment um, from, from your key, key clients or key stakeholders? Okay, thanks, Lenre, and uh, thanks for inviting me onto this panel. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, it was an interesting uh, scenario, and I think everyone experienced the same situation when the when the pandemic hit. Um, there was a, I, say, I guess, really a collective drawing in of breath, uh, whilst people kind of figured out what they were going to do on a day to day basis, and what that meant for a vendor like Finastro was that uh, many of the banks with whom we were engaged kind of paused what they were doing temporarily and had a bit of a think about, you know, are we going to spend, what are we going to spend money on? And, uh, you know, what, what's the priority? And there's lots of reprioritization around perhaps things and budgets and projects that were ongoing uh, whilst they dealt with the immediate problem. And, uh, you know, then I think as, as the crisis wore on, uh, there was an acceptance that actually there is a new norm here. And I know it's an overused phrase, but, you know, we've seen that play out over the last 12 months. Uh, now, what did that mean for a vendor, technology vendor like Finastra? And, you know, there's never a, a kind of a good thing that comes out of a situation like this, I suppose, when you think about the underlying crisis. Um, but, um, well, I guess we were fortunate in, in that we were already on a strategy um, with regards to platformification, cloudification. We'd opened up all the APIs for our, for our products. Um, we'd got a whole bunch of local partners ready. We've begun to collaborate with vendors. And what that did is accelerated uh, our own strategy into that space. So we were we were able then to start to have some very constructive uh, discussions with customers and prospects um, around uh, their digitalization journey, uh, and that you know included existing banks um, where perhaps they hadn't optimized their digital journey where. Perhaps they might have been using us for some aspect of perhaps the back office element of their trade uh, trade processing, um, but had not really a, a embraced, embraced the opportunity that exists with a channel, for example, a digital channel. So it kind of brought those discussions uh, more to the fore. And what we've seen really early in 2021 is a lot more appetite for those kind of discussions, um, you know, much, much more integration, much more, um, I suppose, you know, thinking about how, if you're a bank, how do you present yourself to your customer and how do you enable your customer digitally where perhaps in the past it was satisfactory to have a much more face-to-face -face kind of branch type um, engagement. And then similarly from the back end uh, where, where, particularly documentary trade, which is, you know, and probably always will be in our lifetime, pretty a pretty manual process or labor intensive process. How do you digitalize aspects of that, that perhaps, you know, uh, from a low hanging fruit perspective, you can, you can start to tackle. So yeah, that's our story from Finastra. 
Interesting. I think, I mean, it does ring through what you said in terms of how, you know, the banks um, have always thought about technology as more of a back office solution, um, but then thinking through the front end origination through to transaction process and, of course, documentary trade. But I think, James, you know, it sounds like a, um, this is right up your alley. You know, how has um, Bank One reacted to, to the current environment, um, technology adoptions and any form of digitization that's happened, obviously bearing in mind some of the um, reactions that Phil has um, um, laid out earlier. Sure, thank you, Lanre, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, indeed, uh, this uh, pandemic uh, produced an unforeseen series of events, uh, which uh, introduced twin peaks uh, of a global health crisis, uh, which triggered uh, a global economic crisis. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this happened at quite an inopportune time when we were seeing increase in FDI into Africa uh, we're seeing renewed confidence in infrastructure, development spending, and entrepreneurship uh, for SMEs. Uh, Africa was really looking to leapfrog in digital payments uh, through mobile penetration, financial inclusion for SMEs, uh, and innovation uh, logistical processes, uh, as well as you know, renewable energy solutions uh, that were much needed to, to propel ev evolutionary growth in Africa. International banking, uh, and cross-border business is ultimately uh, susceptible to the shocks in the global economy. Uh, and this was significantly impacted in several ways, uh, both positively uh, and negatively, uh, which we'll get uh, into much more uh, in detail here. But needless to say, really, uh, the pandemic compelled uh, business all across the board, uh, banks, uh, et cetera, uh, to adapt rapidly to this new normal uh, in order to continue to serve our clients uh, throughout this crisis. As we know, especially in trade finance, business never stops. Uh, people need to import and export uh, sustainable goods. Uh, we need to consume energy uh, and even uh, enjoy some lug luxury goods, uh, especially as we see that life is becoming <laughs> increasingly short. Uh, you know, from Mauritius's point of view, uh, when uh, the national lockdown was announced here uh, last year in March, uh, our business was forced to quickly uh, reconfigure our internal processes, uh, build new capacities, equip and empower uh, our teams for successful uh, remote uh, uh, networking, uh, build resilience uh, in our internal process, all the while uh, maintaining a robust risk uh, and control environment. The most uh, notable effect uh, of the global uh, pandemic uh, was that it marshaled uh, a period of accelerated digitization. Uh, efficiency and adoption for uh, agile methodologies, not just for the bank, but really across most industries uh, and businesses. Uh, we see that rapid uh, technology change has been implemented across many types of businesses within a few months, uh, as opposed to some of these three-year strategies uh, that uh, people had uh, been implementing. Our main concern uh, from uh, Mauritius' point of view, uh, as we continue to serve our clients in this uh, cross-border trade and trade financing uh, is to monitor the developments around uh, the FATF uh, from the merchant's point of view and the gray list uh, the EU blacklisting. And to that effect, that's really a global concern uh, that we, uh, we've seen increased cases of fraud uh, around trade finance activities and documentation. Uh, we've seen this uh, evidence uh, with Western banks de-risking and exiting um, from banking activities in Africa altogether uh, due to the lack of clarity uh, on KYC, AML, and due diligence on their trade counterparties. It's just been too costly uh, for them to continue to, uh, to maintain these business lines. Uh, hence, uh, there is a great need uh, to automate and digitize uh, trade finance document checking to improve efficiency, reduce risk, uh, and we do this by using sound and capable platforms. Uh, this will achieve to limit uh, risk and also discourage some of these bad actors uh, who have too much time on their hands uh, now that they're, they're at home uh, and are really causing harm to uh, cross-border trade uh, and trade financing activities. Interesting. No, no, thanks. Thanks for that overview, um, James. And I think a lot of what you say does ring, ring, ring true. Obviously, we've um, all observed quite a lot of... Um, um, a lot of um, you know, news coming out of, of the trade finance ecosystem in terms of 
um, you know, trades gone bad, et cetera. But of course, you know, there is always a role for digitization and that's where, you know, digitization hopefully sort of solves some of this problem or at least reduces um, the cases of, you know, um, some of the challenges you've raised, including um, fraud, KYC, AML. Um, but Margaret, I think, you know, just listening to what we've read from, of course, the non-bank financial institutions where Sofin sits and the bank's um, perspective um, where um, James sits, um, but would you say that, um, you know, the banks, from your experience sitting on the board of a number of fintech companies or technology companies, that the banks have adapted or reacted um, um, speedily enough to adopting new technology or some of the technology solutions that you, um, the firms you advise um, are offering? Well, thanks um, for the opportunity to be here. I'm representing three uh, companies in my professional life, all fintechs. Um, they all are platforms, blockchain based, and they all try to facilitate um, trade finance, not only in Africa, of course, but globally, but all three have a strong focus on emerging markets and therefore also in Africa. And I think our main concern is and always was to make the trade finance but easier, safer, faster, and less cost. And I think what we have realized with the pandemic is that people, companies, and banks have now realized, and I think we heard this also from previous speakers, that digitalization is not a wish anymore, a nice to have. It's a must. If you don't want to lose business opportunity or lose out totally, you have to adopt. And, and that's, I think, been in all our offerings, what we have experienced. But, and I think I said this uh, in some of the conversations I had with people before, I still feel the industry is not adopting fast enough. Bureaucracy is still very large to get the banks moving how they should. And the cooperation between fintechs and banks is still lacking. Uh, even the cooperation between fintechs is lacking. Um, but I think that's something which the pandemic has accelerated. So we should see this as an opportunity and I think it is one, but it still needs quite a bit of work from all parties involved to optimize what digitalization can do for trade finance, because trade finance is the lifehood of all economies. And I think especially in Africa, where there is so much potential, we have to really try to get this now moving fast to the benefit of these rich economies. And I think that's what we as fintechs, trade asset, trade finance market, and Octet Europe, the three companies I am advising, are trying to do. We can also do better, but we need help. And I think we need a little bit of help from central banks, from governments, to make the, the guidelines clear how the banks should do that due diligence. Yeah, because it's a mess. Everybody has different procedures and that slows down the process. So acceleration is what I think we need to bring it to really the full benefits. No, that's it. That's um, you touched on quite a number of um, you know key key points there, Margaret, which includes the interoperability of the um, fintech platforms. Because again, everyone is kind of coming out with various solutions, um, addressing various aspects of the value chain. And I think you know as we've kind of discussed offline, you know which aspect, which product you know is best suited for what bank and you know how many you know technology solutions does a bank adopt to get a transaction done. Um, and of course, the other thing you mentioned, which is quite important, and I think we'll get into it, um, is also sort of the, the regulatory environment across the continent. Um, of course, you know, with you know all, all singing and dancing about the after um, Africa continental trade free trade agreement, which we'll talk about. Um, but of course that is regulation and uh, you know the, the 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 key stakeholders in terms of the government um, keeping pace with this advancement in technology and the requirements on ground for solutions. But I think this actually leads to Nana, which, you know, from a corporate perspective, 
right? Because we've heard from the technology players, we've heard from the banks, the non-banking financial institutions, but, you know, representing a number of corporates as I, I know you do, I mean, in, in Ghana and West Africa, as it were, um, you know, how has technology um, played a role or digitization played a role in helping you um, adapt to the new environment or getting business done um, um, in, in West Africa? I think, I think Lani, great. Yes. So um, underpinning the digital trade is the movement of information. Now, pre-pandemic, even though um, you know, we were seeing a lot of our clients with the um, ability to use these tools, I believe that you know, we were surprised and hit extremely hard by the pandemic and many of the nations in the sub-region were actually not extremely prepared. Um, and that is because in order to use these tools, you have to have certain infrastructure in place, um, good, fast internet, and then the availability of this you know, internet across any nation. Um, so now for um, Imperion, where you know, we have a niche you know, um, advisory, team, especially in the cocoa um, you know, industry, a lot of our clients spend most of their days and weeks in the hinterland ensuring that the produce is being moved from, you know, from the villages um, to, to the port. Now, um, it became a, an extremely difficult um, obstacle because you do have clients who want to be on, um, on calls with you, you, know, you know, with legal teams, with advisors, with um, investment firms, but based on where they are on any given day, it almost became um, impossible. So even though with these tools, you know, it, you know, it was supposed to increase the, the scale, scope and speed of trade, in some of the nations that we, you know, we do a lot of business in, internet was a, the number one obstacle in the way and actually extremely um, you know, reduce the speed um, of trade. Now, normally it would allow firms to bring you know, products um, and services to customers across the globe. But with the lack of infrastructure, we are seeing that some you know, firms, especially the small to medium scale you know, firms in you know, West Africa are suffering. Um, and this is where I believe that there needs to be um, a broader perspective and um, a discussion with the governmental um, agencies, because a lot of these um, um, you know, countries have a, a two to five year plan in terms of making internet available across their nations. Yeah. However, we are seeing that their steps are lacking and that is um, affecting the, the, the efficiency um, um, of trade. Now, if I was to go back to a deal that we closed you know, via Orbit late 2019, which is the $3 million deal that we did with Barack, it was just before the pandemic hit. So you have a brand new firm, you know, it was a greenfield um, you know, opportunity, which normally is extremely tough to finance. And the only way we were able to Close that deal in a very short, um, you know, period was just based on the platform that you know had via in you know, orbit, and the ability of all of the parties involved to be able to communicate via these, um, you know, tools. Twenty twenty, after the COVID hit, we saw a significant reduction um, in business, and I believe that it is because a lot of these firms were trying to pivot to identify, look, what is the future of my firm? If the funding is not available now, do I have enough on my balance sheet in order to carry on? And one of the other um, issues that we found is that being able to fund via a collateral, a physical um, yeah. asset, the lending institution needs to, to perform its due diligence. Yeah. And the pillar in terms of due diligence is the ability to, uh, to visit the site and physically see the assets owned by the firm. Yeah. 
yeah. that when the as soon as the pandemic hit with the borders um, you know being closed it became extremely hard and, and tough for the lending um, you know mm -hmm. um, institutions to be able to travel to these sites and physically inspect these um, um, goods you know, you know goods um, you know um, and and that really um, affected our ability to close deals now yeah. Just at the end of 20, you know, 20, and now in the beginning of, of 20, you know, 21, I believe that the sentiment is that our borders are um, you know, opening. And so we are seeing an uptick in service um, inquiries from small to medium you know, scale firms. And we, we actually believe that mid you know, this year, going to the end of the year, as the borders um, you know, open, um, the lending institutions would now have the um, ability to physically visit these firms. Yeah, no, thanks Thanks for that. Um, and actually, you, you, you did raise um, a very valid point, which, you know, we and the Royal, I, uh, the Royal we kind of take for, um, for granted from other parts of the world, or even like certain cities in Africa, where you think, you know, that the internet uh, penetration is essentially 100% and stable and accessible at all the time. So, I mean, if we don't have that, um, sort of critical infrastructure across the continent, you know, um, you, how then do we even start to jump into the conversation about um, digitization? Well, that, be that as it may, I think Sophie and, and James, this, this kind of comes your way because this is part of, you know, some of the conversations that has been going on and we've also discussed this in terms of the, I mean, the, the education around the ecosystem and, you know, getting either your clients or even internal stakeholders to sort of adopt or think through um, um, digitization as a way to to sort of evolve your current business or even potentially you know go further. So I just wondered, Sophie, you know, what's been your experience with some of the businesses that you've currently um, that you currently you know obviously have in your pipeline or even or are funding and how they've reacted to um, your changing process or um, have they requested or asked more about you know digitization as a way for them to be able to do more business with you? And of course, James, you can. Come back, come take that question after after Sufin. Yeah, I mean, um, thanks, Larry, for the question. And um, like like was uh, Nana mentioning, I mean, uh, visiting our clients is key uh, to establish a relationship and to establish the trust that needs to be in place between a lender and uh, and the borrower. Yeah, we 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 have seen many difficulties in um, in. Um, from the client side to 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 raise funding uh, this year, and especially uh, for for that. But I, I would like to insist on something that uh, in trade finance, uh, what we have seen for the past five five years now, uh, it's difficult to raise funding uh, abroad uh, as an offshore lender uh, in in the trade finance in general, and um, not specifically. It was increased, of course, by the COVID, but it was there. There was a problem from the beginning, and and um, uh, um, for, for an offshore lender, uh, the, the 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 and for any lender, I guess, uh, the problem is the uh, operational aspect of of the of the trade finance. What what it implies, I mean, in terms of monitoring, in terms of controlling, in terms of checking uh, document authenticity. And, uh, and these risks are further increased in Africa and especially in West Africa, due mainly to, to, to three main elements, to, due to the huge informal um, component of the trade finance value chain uh, in, in our countries, due to the re reliability of third parties that are used because we use third parties to secure the transactions like collateral managers and other uh, people intervening in, in the process to, to secure the transaction, but also uh, the, 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 the trustability issue because the trustability of the product is key and especially all the requirements that we bear in terms of ESG, in terms of social and environmental governance to, to, to know where the product come from, is there any child labor from the farm that uh, that the, the where uh, the products came from? So um, I think maybe we need to 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 talk a bit more about uh, the, the the overall uh, digitization of the of the of the supply chain of each commodity, not necessarily speaking only of part of it because all all these things are linked together, and um, yeah, th this is. Uh, 
my feeling, I mean, for, for it. No, that's, that's a very good point. And James, actually, just before you jump in, um, just saying to the, um, to the um, audience, um, please keep the questions coming. I see there are a few really good questions already um, in the Q&A box. So you find the Q&A box, um, I think, to, to the right of your screen, um, if, if it's the same format for all, all operating systems. Um, um, do keep the questions coming. But James, just um, you know, taking it away from what Sofian said um, in terms of, you know, have you seen reactions from the market in terms of your clients um, you know, wanting their process of their access to funds or even getting transactions done to be, to be um, digitized uh, because they want to be able to do more. Is that being the, the, the experience or is there more education that needs to go into the wider ecosystem before we can start to get to any potential critical mass um, with digitization? Sure, uh, Lanre, very, very, very good questions and very good comments coming across really from all the panelists. I think uh, this is a little bit of a, of a two-pronged approach. Uh, I think the first phase, uh, which uh, I touched on a little bit, uh, is for the banks, uh, the financial institutions, uh, those who are providing uh, lending and financing to get their houses uh, in order uh, a little bit, uh, to, um, to, to, to pay attention to their internal processes that will put them in the place uh, to be able to serve their clients on the digital and automated front. Uh, from our side, really it involves bringing together all the players uh, that fall into this category that ultimately serve clients uh, for the cross-border trades and their trade finance activities. What we're doing, uh, for example, uh, here at Bank One and here in Mauritius uh, is we're looking to build uh, a Star Alliance uh, network of banks. Uh, you're familiar, uh, for example, with uh, the airline industry uh, where they utilize local operators to reach, uh, to, to reach you and to get you to your final destination. You can fly uh, KLM from, from Amsterdam to France. From France, you can hop on um, onto Air France and fly to, to Kenya. Uh, from Kenya, you can fly anywhere across Africa using that same Star Alliance network, uh, so to speak. So that's what we've been doing here. Uh, we're looking to develop in that Star Alliance of banks uh, that we can come together and find the right blend of financing uh, and trade structuring solutions uh, to reach the targeted client uh, and the SME. Uh, so this network of commercial banks that uh, we're developing uh, incorporates commercial banks, uh, DFIs, insurance providers, legal advisors, uh, local credit bureaus, uh, and regulatory uh, stakeholders, for instance. So at every point, uh, uh, that you're moving along, uh, there's someone there within our network that can scan, tag, and process your luggage uh, and get you to your next step. And really through this network, uh, there will always be uh, a local bank for us that we can rely on uh, for advice, uh, for custodian services, uh, and on the ground due diligence. What uh, uh, this helps us to do, uh, again, as far as from a margin uh, standpoint, is that now we're able to utilize the Star Alliance network, uh, form club deals uh, out of Mauritius, for example, uh, to be able to support some of these uh, sub-Saharan uh, African banks. And really, uh, we're seeing a lot of activity in, in West Africa uh, that are continuing these trade finance activities. So now we're able to raise money uh, out of Mauritius, for example, where the cost of funding is cheaper. Uh, we're able to provide uh, risk uh, mitigation uh, investment diversification uh, for SSA customers uh, uh, and geographic footprints where we have shareholders and stakeholders uh, that give us enhanced credibility uh, and competitive advantage. Now, on the second aspect of that is for us, we are really looking to support other banks and financial institutions so that they can ultimately support their clients, their SMEs, uh, to continue their, their cross-border activities. We do due diligence on banks in order to finance them for these types of activities. What we've seen is an increase in costs uh, in their IT and automation process. We've reviewed financial uh, management accounts uh, from September 2020, uh, December 2020. We've seen the cost for digitization uh, really skyrocket. So this increase obviously is an immediate cost for the banks, a high cost, but the benefits will also be relatively immediate. Uh, from our side, we are outsourcing our processes and services uh, where there are opportunities that allows us to save costs, 
uh, to drive efficiencies, build scale, uh, access expertise, so that we can ensure uh, greater resilience and uh, really improve uh, uh, labor flexibility. Well, wow, that's, um, that's really interesting, James. Actually, this is, sounds like breaking news to me, this um, Star Alliance of Banks. Um, you've kept that very <laughs> quiet, James. Uh, but I think that's a really good take, key takeaway. And um, intuitively, I can sort of see how that you know, makes sense in terms of um, forming this alliance, particularly from the Mauritian um, standpoint, and obviously creating this um, conveyor belt of services. And, and I think um, it'll be interesting to see how that gets executed. I can still feel smiling like, oh, that sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think just before I kind of move on to the next question, Phil, I think there's a quite an interesting question that's come up here, which I mean, I'll take the first part of it and then um, pass the other bit to you, which is um, someone's asked interoperability between digital solutions uh, is often mentioned. Um, and in this context, you know, would open APIs um, be the answer to solve this for the finance ecosystem? And it's interesting, actually, you, you know, you and I talked about this um, last week in terms of the, the, the solution that um, Finstra is offering to the market, but also from a, from an orbit perspective, uh, one of the things that you know we built into our DNA is always the idea of you know being built on an open API that allows us to integrate and potentially speak to other um, other fintech solutions and um, invariably um, you know not build another island of um, solution like you know what, what currently exists with the banks, um, but just. Phil, I mean, what's your thought on the so open APIs and some of the solutions out there that allows um, not just banks, but other players within the ecosystem to essentially speak to each other through, through digitization? Yeah, it's, um, it's the way forward. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, so if you trace, trace the history of Finastra, which has come about really through the merger of various organizations, our history is in you know, old, customized, embedded, uh, on-premise infrastructure, but we've now moved completely in the other direction, whereby all of our core products, uh, which are deeply embedded in the, in the processes within a bank, are now, all of those product APIs are now exposed up into our, into our platform. And it's an open platform. Um, so, you know, we're a vendor that's got skills in, in, in our core areas, what we don't pretend to be is, uh, you know, uh, being able to deliver all things to all banks, if you like. So we recognize that there's a whole ecosystem of fintechs out there that can add value, if, if you like, across, in this case, the supply chain. Um, and our, because we've opened up our product APIs into our platform, um, any fintech can effectively have a look. Uh, play around with the APIs, go into the sandbox environment and add some value um, to the bank and to the bank's customers. Um, and we're, as an organization, we're pretty flexible in terms of how that interaction takes place. As long as, you know, there's a, there's a proper integration and it's a robust integration and it's a, um, a valid organization. But, uh, you know, the more the merrier, quite frankly, if there's added value that can be brought about um, through this, in, you know, integration through open APIs, then it's a much better thing. And I suppose what that's, that's also identified really is, I think banks are also now looking at a broader proposition. So, I mean, the discussion today is around trade, but when when I think about trade and my history, actually, my background is more in banking than it is in fintech. But when I look across um, trade, I think about that as part of transaction banking, part of, a, part of a supply chain. And supply chain includes, obviously, the movement of not just goods and services, but the settlement for those goods and services as well. And then you can start to open up a debate around um, you know, interoperability between um, payment settlement uh, across Africa. So how do you make that easier? How do you make that easier for banks? How do you make that cheaper, faster, simpler? for SMEs so that they, they can enter the market on a cheaper basis. Um, and the whole kind of receivables management, everything across that supply chain, I think becomes an opportunity. Uh, you just don't, you, you, you don't look at, at trade finance as a particular business silo within the bank and interact with your customer on that basis. You actually interact with them across that whole supply chain so that it touches every part of their business. 
Interesting. No, that's that makes that, that that does make a lot of sense, and you can see how that sort of creates essentially um, efficiency at scale um, for the banks and potentially sort of um, increases the value proposition of technology or adoption of digitalization. Um, Margaret, I'll just come to you for um, for a second and yourself and um, and and Nana on this because you obviously, as you already mentioned, you do advise and sit on the board of um, about three fintech companies, and obviously they are trying to get their products or services into Africa probably West Africa. Um, one of the questions that come from the audience is that, you know, which of these solutions um, is best suited for um, the African market or for West Africa in particular in this case? Um, I don't know if from your experience at conversations, you know, representing any of these three um, fintechs and, you know, speaking into the market, you think, I mean, you sort of the reaction you've gotten is um, in one particular direction or the other um, based on the offering. Yeah, I, I think uh, two offerings are stronger for West Africa, if that's uh, the focus. That's the trade finance market, which offers commodity finance over a block blockchain platform, which is also uh, offers uh, the avoidance of double funding, which I think is a, is a very important subject in the market now. I think trade assets, also facilitates for banks to communicate if they want to uh, achieve asset sales or asset generation. So both will be very, very, very useful for West Africa. But obviously all solutions are global and therefore um, I wouldn't want to focus only on, on West Africa. But I also believe, and we haven't mentioned that so much, it's also important that we educate, especially, and there I think West Africa is a very important part for our efforts. They need education. They don't really very often fully understand what is available with regard to products, with regard to digitalization, what it can do for them. And then again, the FinTechs, which uh, I think Phil uh, mentioned very well, have to work better together. And James made the point, maybe fintechs should create a star alliance as well. <laughs> Another break but to be honest, I think we have so many platform offerings for trade finance, inclusive payments, facilitation, et cetera, but they don't bring the door to door together. Very often, some do, but only only very few. Mm. If we could bring this onto one and make it less of a jungle for banks, customers, clients, everyone, I think it would help because at the moment there are great offerings out there. Yeah. But so much that maybe banks find it difficult to choose. Yeah. And they spend so much time to evaluate, yeah? So if we could bring this idea, James, I think I'm a bit sold on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bring an alliance together on the FinTech side as well, where products could be, you know, complementary to each other. And I'm sure that's very much the case. No, we definitely. can help everybody, yeah? Not yeah. only West Africa, but West Africa <laughs> great beneficial uh, part of it. No, definitely. Sure. That, sounds, that sounds good. Um, if my brain was quick enough, I would have thought about what the other um, flight solution to Star Alliance, the competitive one is. But I'm <laughs> well, maybe if I can just quickly add to that, uh, Lana, Margaret, you're, you're absolutely right. I think um, from our side, we really need to move away uh, from the premise that we need to own uh, all our digital processes. You know, as we continue to develop alliances, uh, with, you know, we need to come together with regards to uh, procurement of technology and partnerships uh, with fintechs uh, and other digital uh, and automation platform providers. Because what ultimately needs to happen is that all these uh, different platforms uh, need to be able to speak to each other so that we can end, uh, end up serving our, our clients uh, and facilitate their business uh, and trade with us just in the background facilitate. No, that's a very good point you make, um, James. I think there's a quite good question here for, for Nana and one which I would um, also tackle myself. 
And, um, you know, someone is asked, you know, what type of digital trade solutions do panelists think, um, you know, um, West Africa needs the most, you know, and we talked about this, of course, earlier, which is basically, again, as we say, you know, there's so many aspects to the entire value chain. And of course, we talked about the APIs integrating, you know, there's a deal generation side of the, of the, of the equation. There is a transaction processing documentation. Um, and, you know, essentially as a corporate, you know, where do you go, where do you start from as a bank, you know, what platform um, do you, do you deal with? I think, you know, bearing, just, you know, bearing in mind, what are the, what's the problem, what's the core problem within the sort of Africa and therefore, you know, West African ecosystem? Is it the access to the funding, which, and obviously based on the African Development Bank um, reports, you know, over 60% of SMEs are unable to access funding. So essentially they get turned away from the banks. So don't, don't even worry about getting into the process of digitizing what you're trying to do. You're not even letting them in the door to get started with. And I think Nana, you know, as you mentioned, in terms of the example of the transaction that you completed through, um, through the orbit platform, you know, uh, what's your view on what would be some of the immediate solutions from a corporate perspective on the ground and what they would like to see um, in terms of digitization to help them essentially grow their business, really? Uh, yeah, Larry, that's a great question. So, um, um, so despite these um, small and medium scale enterprises being key, you know, pillars of the continent, um, economy, they have um, traditionally been um, you know, struggling to find the capital that they need to grow. Now, in terms of, of the digital tools, I would like to mention you know, something that I think we may have all ignored. That is the cultural nuance, right? So there is um, a cultural aspect here, especially in the West African um, you know, region. And that is the understanding that a face-to-face transaction where you physically meet with an individual and sit down and get the trust is better than doing anything via internet or um, you know, on the phone. So for even our Imperial Energy, in many um, instances, I've had to fly back home and physically you know, sit down um, and meet with clients. The number one tool that has helped us is the use of the Dropbox you know, type you know, feature where a client is able to, um, to submit information on their firm, so in terms of their business plan, their profile, their financials, um, because it helped to remove you know, the amount of, of paper that is, is typically used um, in these deals. And the introduction of e-files allows for secure end-to-end -end, um, you know, you know, discussions and transactions. But on the flip side, we are seeing that the Traditional banks in West Africa are still relying on, you know, age-old paper-based, um, you know, systems and um, outdated ways of doing business. So you may have a client who is looking for um, a certain amount of money. The information that they have is enough to secure the funding. And, and let's say the top management may not be in the nation at that time. But in order to arrange a meeting with a bank, it becomes a face-to-face -face, you know, issue. We have to physically you know, meet with you and sit down with you, go through uh, all of the documents. And this is really based on risk. And that is because in West Africa, we don't have a credit-based you know, system where individuals or firms are able to build up their credit as they do business. So every transaction is seen by a bank as unique. Mm -hmm. On the other side, we also have you know, clients that are um, able to pledge any of their collateral to multiple banks. You know, I, I think you know, four or five years ago in Ghana, we had um, an issue where a client had pledged the same collateral to multiple banks. And really, in this you know, era, this isn't you know, something that should happen because there should be a way to be able to convert the ownership of the collateral in a system where it's impossible to change you know, ownership until the trade you know, deal is complete. We are seeing that you know, it's, it's, it's a significant you know, difficult in that um, you know, aspect. So for Ghana and the West African um, you know, region, a platform like um, you know, Orbit or um, you know, something like, um, uh, like the Dropbox where there is a secure exchange of information 
and material, and especially the corporate information that you know every top manager is scared of sharing because your financials are really key to your ability to do you know business, and you wouldn't want those to fall into the wrong hands. Yeah. So, to the fintech firms out there, the ability to create a niche you know, platform like this would really help. Another tool may be the use of the mobile phone. So yeah. in West Africa, we are seeing that um, even the mom and pops, you know, uh, you know, businesses are using their mobile phones to transact a lot of business. Yeah. And for us, uh, you know, a lot of us are always um, on social media, on Facebook, you, you know, YouTube. Should there be an app that allows the secure uploading and downloading of such um, information by anyone, no matter where they are, it would be a useful tool because immediately it would reduce the amount of time that you know it takes for these documents um, you know to be shared, and then it also makes these you know documents available on yeah. any you know um, you know you know tool that uh, you may have. These are the gaps that I currently see. And yeah. these are really obstacles in the way of doing business in West Africa right now. No, thanks. Thanks for that, Nana. I know we could go on forever and talk about all of this. Um, we Our time is kind of wrapping up shortly, but I don't think we would um, do this um, panel of justice without touching on um, ESG, which is actually, and again, you know, it's come straight to the top of a lot of investment conversations. Um, I know we'd have liked to talk about the African Continental Future Agreement, but I think that's kind of been touched on in various aspects. There's a really good question here about sort of, you know, how do you go about with digitization of ESG, right? When you have the likes of African Invest, um, um, you know, telling any corporate that comes in their door, like, yo, show me your ESG, um, ESG report and the guys like e what's like what's that what does that mean so maybe just for a second um Sophie, if you just very quickly just talk about your thoughts on potentially some of the solutions for digitization of you know incorporating the ESG into the trade process mm -hmm. and how that could be digitized and then of course we just go around the house um uh, for one minute each and just your final words yeah thank you Laurie v very interesting question um and um yeah I mean I I I mean, all of us, I mean, raising funds from DFIs, from all, I mean, and it's it's a world trend today to um, all these um, uh, ESG requirements. And um, so the issue with trade finance and uh, what we, we, we are facing uh, with regards to ESG can be resolved by traceability of the product. Because, I mean, um, we need to make sure that uh, the product is coming from a farm that is respecting the rules, that is not employing any child labor. And the, 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 the structure of the trade finance is uh, in Africa is made by many, many uh, steps, many middlemen. So to reach out to the farmer, it's already very complicated. Um, I think some countries in, in, in West Africa, and especially in Ghana, are more advanced on the cocoa. They have some traceability um, uh, initiatives, but in the other countries, it's it's uh, it's a real problem. I mean, we 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 cannot even know from which farm the product came from, and this is. Um, this is going to be key, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, for the uh, digitization of the whole supply chain of the trade finance and which will uh, ease a lot uh, because we are seeing all these initiatives of digitization in, in parts of the process, but they need to communicate together and everything. And I think the key for that is, is the trustability of the product. Awesome. Thanks for that. I think just, just thank you so much for something. That's really, really interesting. Um, I think just 30 seconds each, um, any final words on thoughts um, in terms of um, digitization and just, you know, what you'd like to leave the audience with 30 seconds each. Margaret, you can go first. Ladies yeah, first. <laughs> I thought you meant ladies first. <laughs> so I think my final word would really be let's cooperate better between banks, between fintechs, and understand better what we can create if we are working together rather than protecting little niches. I think that would be my wish for West Africa, but also for the world, because I think only together can we 
optimize what we can achieve in this process, which is absolutely essential to boost trade finance, which is so important for the economies in this world. West Africa, one of them only. Thank you. Um, Phil? Wow, uh, follow that. Uh, I'm not sure I can particularly, but I, I mean, I echo everything that you've just said there, actually, Margaret. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're a fintech vendor. We have a small part to play in all of this. But um, I suppose my, my thoughts are, you know, we're, are we at the we beginning of a new age? Let's talk well, mate, together. Yeah, <laughs> mate, and that's, that's true. And I think that's probably the message here, actually. There's just so much more. Uh, that can be done here and I was going to say uh, we're at the beginning of a new age but I think we were already at the be beginning of a new age now we kind of need to figure out where we go with it. Nice. Um, James? Sure uh, for us we continue to have tremendous appetite for West Africa we're seeing we're continuing to see a lot of trade activity there's a huge population that's concentrated in, in West Africa uh, we have good appetite for for Nigeria Ghana Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Burkina Faso, Benin. Unfortunately for us, uh, however, we've had to reduce uh, our corporate lending activities because of the guidelines that require us to do on-site visits and even annual visits. You can see where that is a challenge now. So hence the, the Star Alliance Network. We need to have local partners uh, and be able to support local uh, commercial banks, financial institutions, so that they can ultimately uh, reach um, uh, their particular clients. The one thing that we need to be uh, in, in this discussion is, is very pertinent is that in order to facilitate all these discussions and everyone has been saying the same thing, we need to automate and digitize some of these processes so that it limits the need for us to be physically present there. We need to have that comfort, that security we need to know that everything along each particular process is compliant. Uh, if it's not compliant, it, it doesn't get beyond uh, uh, the, the gate. Fantastic. That's it. Thanks for that. Nanani, just one quick word, 10 seconds. Yeah, so, um, you know, for um, Imperion and the spread that we are seeing now this year, you know, we do believe that improvements in the, um, in the trade, you know, tools, uh, you know, have the um, you know the um, you know, potential to reduce costs and to promote the greater economic inclusion in, um, in in the aspect of global finance. Um, now, apart from the advantages, we still see some you know constraints in terms of wider adoption of these tools. So eventually, it may get to a point where the private you know sector and government need to develop you know a high level you know framework. Of rules that are going to cover the use um, of these tools eventually. Fantastic. Well, thank, thanks for that. I think um, there we have it, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope everyone is at a couple of um, key takeaways from, from this conversation. I think um, for me, the top three definitely number one being the Star Alliance. I think, um, James, with that conversation, um, that has been a, a definitely a, a key winner than actually, you know, interesting concepts, which I think we, we might see that permeate across the trade finance ecosystem in Africa. Um, of course, um, traceability, which touches on not just the, the flow of goods and capital, but ca um, the flow of goods, but also capital and the efficiency that creates. And of course, I mean, how that impacts and helps um, with ESG growth. And of course, um, the, the interoperability of fintechs um, to ensure that um, not only are fintechs able to interface with each other, but also interface with the banks and all the key, all the key players within the ecosystem. Well, thanks everyone and um, enjoy the rest of your evening, afternoon and mornings, wherever you are. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Okay.